Well, I have my news up here at Adesawe in Kanda. This is News 360. I am Alfred Okansi. And I am Aisha Yakubu. Coming up in the bulletin this evening. Acrylic paint. And Napa Foods. My life insurance. Forty-eight persons who tested positive in Obuasi for COVID-19 cannot be traced for follow-up. Also tonight, minority justified decision to file motion seeking to reject constitutional instrument laid by the Electoral Commission for the December polls. And lawyers for founder of Capital Bank at Tuesian have told an Accra High Court their client is negotiating with the Attorney General to refund 27.5 million CDs to the state. Also tonight in business, about 5,000 applicants access online portal to apply for government 600 million Ghana City stimulus package. On the international front, U.S. to withdraw from major accord that permits an armed aerial surveillance flights over dozens of participating countries. We'll have an interactive tonight, also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. And now 48 persons who tested positive in Obwase for COVID-19 cannot be traced for follow-up. The Ashanti Regional Health Director, Dr. Emmanuel Tinkran, has attributed the trend to the fear of stigma and uh, discrimination attached to COVID-19. The inability of health workers in finding persons who have contracted COVID-19 for follow-up and treatments could impact negatively on the fight against the spread of the virus. The health directorate is therefore entreating the public not to stigmatize persons who have contracted COVID-19. Anytime somebody is diagnosed as positive, they don't want to own up and then support. So we can address some of these challenges if we reduce stigma and then the discrimination. On the current situation in Obuasi, the Ashanti Regional Health Director said there has been a reduction in new infections in the municipality. The number of new cases that we are having are not as many as that we recorded in April, comparing that of May. So that means that whatsoever we are doing, we are doing it right. And that... Uh, we should continue to do it and then adhere to the protocols and then the guidelines. Obuasi Municipal continues to be the epicenter of COVID-19 in the Ashanti region with 386 cases. This is followed by Obuasi East with 206 cases and Kumasi Metro with 83 cases. The Ashanti region currently has over 900 cases of the disease with seven deaths. Many people in Ghana who have recovered from COVID-19 still face intense stigmatization and discrimination despite calls to end such acts. With a growing hardship these recovered persons face, including job losses, there are now calls for a holistic approach in relating with them. My son drove me to the roadside. An ambulance came. My wife was there. My daughter was there. My son... Then the whole start, family started crying because of the news out there. So me myself, uh, I became worried. But all the same, I gathered the courage, packed down my small things, and I left. The only thing that we do over there is that they call you on phone. They don't get closer to you. They just call you, Fred, are you OK? I say, I'm OK. Then they'll just push your food to a, a door. Then you pick the food, then they close the door. Nobody wants to get closer to me. After sharing his recovery journey with Ghanaians, Frederick says he has been battling with stigmatization. Narrating his ordeal on New Day with Bella Mundi on Thursday morning, Frederick says he has lost his job. I have really, I don't know if you use the word regretted coming to the TV stations. Because currently, I tried to, I was discharged, I think, on the 5th or the 12th, one Sunday. 
up to now, I've been to the West Place about five days, five times. Nobody is able to patronize me. Hmm. People get, they, the moment they see me coming, they, they, they are scared. Nobody wants to get closer to me. Currently, I've lost my job. I'm in the house. Nobody oh. wants to do anything about me, me again. His marriage is in shambles. Continue to educate the people. I'm suffering. Currently, I'm suffering due to the, the family. This stigma issue is not even affecting my marriage. But at certain times that it's wife, affecting your yes, marriage. Yes, yes, yes. How? Yes, yes, really. She goes to town, and when, when she comes back, at times, uh, the way people treat her, she'll come there, she'll become furious, and all kinds of things. You know. Oh. At a press briefing at the Ministry of Information on Thursday morning, a medical doctor who has recovered from COVID-19 also shared her experience. Because of the fact that I was desaturating and um, I had multi swallowing, a decision was taken that I moved to the regional hospital, um, the female ward, and there I was admitted. And then on arrival, my saturation or my oxygen levels was between 75 to 85 cent room air. So immediately um, oxygen was put on me and then IV medications started. Even though my test results were negative, I mean negative, I had all the signs of the COVID. But unlike Frederick, Dr. Gillian says she hasn't experienced any form of stigmatization, but appealed to Ghanaians to desist from the act. I will urge the general public to stop the stigmatization of persons who are who suffered or who are suffering from COVID-19, for history will judge by the way we treat them. Lead medical doctor at the Lekma Isolation Center, Emmanuel Amankra, says the issue of stigmatization is gradually crippling activities at the hospital. People even come to the hospital and they are shy to even mention the symptoms that they've seen on TV. They've seen on TV that we talk about fever, sore throat and cough. So even if they have that, usually at the screen and the triage area where they are asked their symptoms, that's what you're supposed to say. They don't say it. So when, so they come into contact with the doctor, and then later on, they say that, oh, I'm coughing or I have a fever. He recommends more education of the general public to tackle stigmatization. We have to talk more about it. We have to let people know after you're confirmed, after you're recovered, you're recovered. So observe the normal social distancing and the mask that you do. The person is still the same person you knew or you know. So no need to actually be stigmatized about. Ghana's case count, as at May 20, according to the Ghana Health Service, stands at 6,269 with 1,898 recoveries and 31 deaths. Well, the issue of stigmatization is a big deal because you know what? What does that is that it exposes all of us to this virus because people who have it fear of being stigmatized, keeping it to themselves, walking around normal as if nothing is happening. But this is what the confirmed cases, as you heard right there, is right now. 6,269, as you uh, might really be aware, and the recovery is also now 1,898. All up uh, increased um, uh, in numbers there. In, in, in the case count, for example, 173 additional cases were added on and over the last 24 hours and then the recoveries as you see right there. But the regional breakdown, Greater Accra still has 4,582, Ashanti region 921, Central region 285, Western region 170, Eastern region has 106 cases, um, that's a Western North region 57, Volta region 41, Northern region 31, Oti region 26, Upper East region 26, Upper West region 21, and Northeast region has two cases, and uh, Bono region has one case. But straight into uh, a Kumasi, the specifically in the Ashanti region, um, if you look at the Kumasi Metro, comes second in terms of this bar graph in, with respect to the reported COVID-19 cases and deaths by district in the Ashanti region. Obuasi, obviously, leads there with the highest uh, bar there in this bar graph which is number one, Kumasi Metro follows, and then Ofori Chrome follows, Echiwan Kwangwa follows, Kwabre East follows, Asqua follows uh, in that order, then Kwada, so Echiwan will be just south, Tafo, Asokorima and Poenjiso, and Echiwan will be just north, Efijak Kwabre south, and then it goes uh, through to Bekwai Suame, Seche South, Bosumche Adanse South, Seche East, Seche Front Plains, Asantia Kim South, Amansia uh, Central, all these districts have recorded 
cases of COVID-19. Now, let's go now and still look at what is happening in, in Obuasi. You recall the first story brought to you, some 48 persons are nowhere to be found after contact traces. We're trying to get to them to communicate their results to them. Now, Dr. Michael Ousu is a clinical microbiologist and a lecturer at the Department of Medical Laboratory Technology at University. He's one of the lead researchers at the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research, and he joins me via Skype. Good evening to you, Doc. Thank you so much for your time uh, this evening. You're aware of this situation with in Kuma, uh, that's Obwasi, the 48 uh, persons who cannot be traced, and you say it all boils down to stigmatization? Yeah, uh, good evening um, uh, uh, to your viewers. So I think that this is the reality of, of what happens when uh, we identify cases that are positive. So if you have 500 positive cases to Boise and you are not able to trace 48, that forms about 9.6% of those uh, people that you detected. It, it, it is pretty uh, normal to see that you may not have the chance of getting to all these people. And as we already said, Stigma plays an important role in this, and it's not just 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 uh, common to Ghana. A different part of Africa have the same experiences. From the time of Ebola, many people who were known to be Ebola positive wouldn't want to even let people know that they have the disease. Uh, in Ghana, we are now beginning to see what it means by stigma and and how people relate to others who tend to have the virus. And I think that this is what is happening. So this is a clear picture of how people are responding to this virus almost on a daily basis, which is why we need to educate the populace and let them to understand that this is a virus that, that is coming to live with us. I mean, we have to learn to live with the virus and we must learn to relate to the virus and we must learn to respond to the virus in a very good way. Well, but how, how much of a risk are the people in Obuasi exposed to? I mean, if these 48 persons cannot be found uh, because of stigmatization. I mean, then it means they may be walking around, uh, nobody knows. Well, exactly why I believe you have such a, a, a huge surge in the numbers in, in Obuasi. For every case that escapes uh, the contact tracing will also form another chain of transmission cycle. And the person begins to, to form his own. So each of the 48 people will form their own transmission cycle. And then the, the surges will just keep on going. So this is why you always want to tackle this aspect of stigma, contain the people who have the disease so that they don't go out spreading. And I think it's one area that we need to bring the community on board. We need to bring the chiefs, the religious leaders, and the, the social scientists, the community leaders and the assemblymen, for all of them to join in this so that we'll be able to find a better way of solving this problem. This is what is peculiar to us in Africa. So if we have stigma becoming something that we have to fight with, then of course we must evolve every level of the community so that they can help all of us to deal with this. Now, uh, did, did, what did we do wrong, very briefly, uh, from the onset of tackling this? I mean, the way we were picking suspected persons up, you know, people describe it as a Rambo style ambulance, people all suited up, and then the kind of communication, stay away from people who are coughing and all of that. Did that indirectly contribute to what we're seeing right now? Yes, I, I, I will agree to that. I think that, first of all, communication to, the, to those who turn out to, 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 to have the disease has not been the best. Uh, some of them were communicated to via phone, and we should have involved the clinical psychologists at the very onset for them to at least talk to these people, for them to accept who they are, and then cooperate with authorities. Sometimes, as you're, you've heard, some ambulance and sirens will go about uh, interview, uh, getting to the people who are positive, and it's, it's not the best. So people can see others that seem to have the disease, and people are in their PPEs moving to their houses and interviewing them. This has been a problem, but I think that going forward, we need to learn from these mistakes and begin to improve on them. Else, as the disease spreads to the local communities, uh, we, we should brace ourselves with this. And the difficulty is that as as you get to the rural areas, if we are not able to manage this properly, then people will begin to attack the health professionals and put their lives in danger because they may see them as people that they don't want to see. They want to trace the people who are positive, but then they will fight back. And we don't want to, we, this is not what, where we want to get to. And I think the earlier we begin to re-strategize, the better for all of us. Dr. Michael also, thank you.
as always, for your time. And do have a good evening. Dr. Michael also is a virologist and also a senior researcher at the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research. Stigmatization. Let's all do our bit to address this situation. Aisha. Absolutely. And our government has allayed concerns from the public that it will soon ease restrictions on social gathering. Information Minister Kojopo Nkrumah at a press briefing in Accra said government will call for a national conversation on easing restrictions. According to the World Health Organization, the coronavirus pandemic could linger for a while, hence the need to develop measures to contain its spread. Government last week announced it had begun the process of engaging stakeholders in the various sectors of the economy on measures needed during the post-restriction era. However, there has been mixed reactions from the public with regards to easing restrictions for some form of normalcy to return. Information Minister Kujo Pon Nkrumah says, although there is no specific timeline for the lifting of ban on restrictions, the country must strategize on the way forward. The world is coming to a realization that what appeared to be one of the best preventive methods, which was everybody stay at home, be locked down at home, cannot go on in perpetuity. And so at some point, as you are seeing all over the world, there will need to be an easing of some of the restrictions. He also clarified news making rounds that schools will reopen soon. We notice that there are a lot of stakeholder groups and parents and unions that appear a bit apprehensive since those reports came out. It is okay to be apprehensive, indeed. but we must channel those apprehensions and those worries towards answering the question, what does it take? What will be the best way to protect teachers, non-teachers, uh, students, if we are to open up at some point? Well, in a related development, Deputy Education Minister in charge of basic and secondary education, Dr. Yao Osei Edichum, says government is not in a rush to reopen schools. According to him, the Ghana Education Service has begun consultation with stakeholders and any decision to reopen schools will be based on science and data. I'll be mindful of that issue uh, Veronica Bucket, I'll be mindful of, of running water, I'll be, I'll be mindful of how teachers protect themselves, I'll be mindful of the class size, which will be a major, major uh, thing that we have to take a look at. As I said, what Germans have done and other countries have done, there's no country that have done open of schools without so substantial social distancing to make sure that you are not putting a teacher at risk and a student at risk. No, no country has begun school without adequate social distance and I don't think Ghana will be an exception. Regarding a possible reopening of schools, Dr. Educhum said the decision apart from the assessment and engagement by the GES will also largely depend on health considerations. Because I don't think anybody will say I'm going to open schools and there's no running water and that children cannot wash conditions. Yes, there are a number of things and that is why in many countries they did not open all schools. They start from somewhere, develop the self-efficacy for which they know it's possible. Then they rule in other schools. So in a Ghanaian contest, I'm sure GES is going to get inputs. In some other stories tonight, lawyers for founder of Capital Bank Atuasian have told an Accra High Court their client is negotiating with the Attorney General to refund 27.5 million cities to the state. According to his lawyer, Balfour Jehu Bonsu, Atuasian had already paid an amount of 1.4 million cities out of the total amount. According to lawyer for Atuasian, Balfour Jehu Bonsu, negotiations are ongoing with the Attorney General to get the money paid to the state. The state, represented by Chief State Attorney Mariana Apiaopon, confirmed to the court the intention of Atuasian to pay the amount. She requested for a detailed proposal to be submitted to the Director of Public Prosecution for a review where a determination would be made afterwards. 
Justice Eric J. Bafo ordered for lawyers of the accused to make available the proposal within a month. William Atuisian is facing trial with three former executives of the defunct Capital Bank, Fitzgerald Odonko, Kate Kwate Papafiu and Teteneti for 26 charges leveled against them. Prosecution is expected to give feedback to the court on June 28 on whether the proposal has been granted or rejected. Oh, this is your election command center. The minority in parliament has justified its decision to file a motion seeking to reject the constitutional instrument laid by the Electoral Commission for the December polls. After being in parliament for eight of the mandatory 21 days, Speaker Professor Michael Quay has admitted the motion will require two thirds of majority to throw it out of the House. Boko Central MP Mahama Yarga has been explaining the decision to file. Constitutional instrument is laid in parliament and matures after 21 days when there is no objection to its coming into force. If there's an objection to its coming into force, then you will have to get two thirds of the membership of parliament to vote rejecting the coming to force of the CI. So this CI was laid, the 21 days has not yet run out, and I have an objection to the CI coming into force. And the proper procedure is to come by motion and make a case to the House why they should vote by a two-thirds majority to reject the CI and prevent it from coming into force. And that is why I have uh, uh, put in the motion. The motion was uh, uh, taken by my leader, Honorable Harun Aitwesu, and given to the clerk at table. And today, Thursday, ordinarily, they would have held a business committee meeting. And I believe that at the business committee meeting, a decision should have been taken on how to treat the motion and I hope to hear something from the majority leader tomorrow. The, the committee can decide not to meet, they can decide not to present a report, parliament can decide not to debate it after 21 days. Meanwhile, the NDC has denied suggestions by the NPP that the constitutional instruments currently before Parliament was discussed at the IPAC meeting it boycotted. The Director of Elections and the party's communication director alleged the governing party and the Electoral Commission are scheming to rig the December polls. NDC presser, it's the second in the series of what the largest opposition party describes as exposing the agenda to rig the elections after its first press conference earlier in the week the general secretary of the mpp john buedu claimed the ec discussed the ci at the very meeting the ndc boycotted now your bomb is as usual your my general introduction by the chairperson uh, sitting in okay. at that time now then the token rose up said all kinds of things to the sense of kasa cry kasa on the door and we don't know three fire so say the proposed CI was laid in Parliament on the 17th of March 2020, eight clear days before the 25th of March 2020, IPAC meeting in question. So how then do you say that a CI that has already been laid in Parliament was discussed at a subsequent IPAC meeting? Complete falsehood and a very unintelligent one that. Again, the NDC says it is amused at the justification response by the National Identification Authority. The NIA again has confirmed our position that the snail pace of Ghana card registration exercise is largely incomplete and that they are now waiting for the COVID-19 situation in the country to subside so they can embark on a mop-up and card distribution exercise in some, in some regions. The big question therefore is why will Jim Manson led EC rely 
on an identification card, Ghana card, whose issuance is largely incomplete and fraught with several anomalies and demographic disparities. The party further made a revelation. We have written to the Ghana Statistical Service and they have supplied us with information which shows that only 600,000 Ghanaians have turned 18 years this year, only 600,000. The voter re register we have is made up of 16 million people. And so if on grounds of public health, we even decide that this year we will not do limited registration exercise, it doesn't change or it wouldn't change much. A very good evening to you. Thanks for staying with us on News 360. Let's do business now. My name is Nana Ikuya Mensa Brampa. About 5,000 applicants have been able to access the online portal to apply for government's 600 million Ghana CD stimulus package for small and medium scale enterprises affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, applicants have been urged to contact their nearest NBSSI business advisory center within their districts for assistance if they face any challenges. We have about 5,000 plus applicants on the platform who registered and are waiting to go on to the next stage. We are happy to say that we are started and ready. We have provided accessibility. The technology is working. She, however, stated that there has been numerous reports from applicants since the beginning of the process and assured that the NBSSI is working to solve all challenges. The USSD code turns out at some point. It is important to note that the USSD is a short process and so we have to be efficient in inputting data onto that. And also there were some technology or network challenges. And so we've worked to ensure that we have an efficient delivery of the USSD going forward. We also have set up a grievance center to ensure that all the complaints that we have would come to the portal to assist us answer the challenges that we face. Chief Executive Officer of the Private Enterprises Federation, Nana Osebunsu, spoke about the importance of meeting the stipulated requirements. If you have A, B, C, or 10, uh, register with GRA or what, those kind of things, that you qualify. You qualify meaning you can send an application. But then it doesn't mean an automatic shoe in that you're going to get it. So we have to wait after the event closes in the sense that applications were received, processes ensued, disbursement was made and then we say okay these are the ones that however called for calm amongst members during and after the process if the data says 10 people applied the same criteria somebody got to make a decision not all 10 are going to get it so if we see transparency is a key the fact that Ghanaians don't have confidence in government normally or government processes is one of the things that we try to avoid to make sure that transparency exceeds people's expectation the package has a one-year moratorium and two-year repayment period for micro, small, and medium-scale businesses. Right, so if you are an SME and you've been affected by COVID-19 pandemic, this is the time for you to visit that portal and then apply for that stimulus package. Away from that now, the Ghana Chamber of Mines and the Institute of Environmental Assessment have indicated revenue from the mining sector should be channeled to sectors that have large value chain, such as agriculture, in order to accelerate Ghana's post-COVID-19 economic recovery. The organizations agreed mining has and is critical in the economic development process. When we had a lockdown, um, government took the decision that mining, giving up a degree in terms of health and safety and the importance of the mining industry to the economy, um, we should continue to operate and we are quite grateful for the opportunity. You find countries with robust systems on health and safety um, already in place that still operated under the present circumstance. However, with the social distancing, you notice that the production time will be lower. 
CEO of the Ghana Chamber of Mines, Suleiman Nakoni, noted the contribution of mining to development of the country goes beyond post-COVID-19 economic recovery. We continue to operate and it therefore means that the opportunities which mining companies continue to provide to the supply chain participants, for example, would continue to be there. CEO of the Institute of Environmental Assessment, Dr. Eric Chum, noted it will take some time for mining companies to hit optimum production. We have companies who will have to find innovative ways to operate, for instance, in automation because of the social distancing. And so companies with such initiatives will be able to survive and uh, support um, their workers and the, and the government. Mining and metal companies may be exposed to swings in market demand during and post COVID-19. There might be a spike in the need for production of a lot of metal that are needed by industry for the recovery. With economics, you understand when, when there's the demand for it, of course, the prices goes up. And the only advantage you can take of it is to ensure you have production. Right, let's turn our attention to the Ashanti region now, where business owners say their supplier credit has reduced to 20% in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The situation is pushing many businesses to fold up and thousands of workers rendered vulnerable due to income loss and layoffs. The International Labour Organization estimates that 1.25 billion workers representing 38% of the global workforce are employed in sectors that are now facing severe decline in output and at high risk of displacement due to the coronavirus pandemic. The Ashanti Business Owners Association Abua says its members are currently exploring appropriate measures to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their operations. Such measures include pay cuts and layoffs. The credit that we are getting from our suppliers are no more the same because they feel that tomorrow is uncertain and for that matter the level of credit that they have to extend, they have to reduce it. As of now, the credit that I used to enjoy, we are around 20% of the credit that we used to have. Lead consultant at Corporate Vision Consult, Charles Kusi Apia Kubi, says if the situation persists, commercial banks will be affected negatively. There's a possibility of banks even recording delinquencies possibility of getting high defaults because if businesses are not making profit they can't even pay you and it also affects government revenue now government has assured of the safety of its electronic payment systems as part of efforts to increase financial inclusion acting director of the financial sector division of the Finance Ministry Samson Akligo says the introduction of the Ghana digital payments roadmap is timely. The strategy, which is also to help create economic opportunities and reduce poverty, forms part of the three new initiatives introduced by the government to speed up financial inclusion and digital payments to transform the economy. Already, due to the coronavirus pandemic, Ghanaians have been encouraged to use digital payment systems to reduce physical interaction and the possible spread of the virus. It is a government policy that was done together with uh, private sector participants. It was done with uh, the likes of the World Bank and Better Than Cash and SIGAP. Uh, all the regulators on the financial uh, sector were included. And therefore, it is more of um, maybe a Ghana document. So it's not really like government uh, alone. Acting Director of the Financial Sector Division of the Finance Ministry, Samson Akligo, says this will also widen the financial inclusion net. Really, the benefits of some of these policies is already been felt in this COVID period. And therefore... Uh, and a lot of these policies uh, actually started before COVID. So it's just a coincidence. Actually, it's, it's improved the 
level of preparedness of the country. In, you know, even in a period of restriction, livelihood transfers across the country can still continue. He assured the public of the safety on the platforms due to special security provisions in the policy. A very strong element of the policy, if you go through, that talks about consumer protection. And that also talks about financial uh, education and awareness. And really all these things are drawn from the lessons that we have learned, even from the recent financial sector cleanup. So yes, uh, the key, we, we are very much uh, committed in educating people and strengthening consumer protection across the various regulators. The introduction of the three new policies conform to calls for telecommunications and fintechs to develop creative ways of turning mobile phones and mobile money platforms into vehicles of economic emancipation for the players in the large informal sector. And just before I go, the Ghana city marginally depreciated against all of its major trading currencies. You can get more detail of that as well as other stories on 3news.com. That's it for business tonight. I am Nana Ikuya, Mensa Abrampa, Juliet B. Wise next with sports. This is News 360. Hello, good evening and welcome to the sports segment here on News 360 with me, Juliet Bewa. Now, board chairman of the club licensing board of the Ghana Football Association, Dr. Kwame Baniyako says, any consideration made or against or that is made for or against the return to domestic football should be informed by research. Speaking to TV3, he underscored why it is important to adhere to scientific basics than a judgment that only takes into account commercial factors. Any decision to either continue playing the game or not should be based on research. We are looking at what we are losing by playing and what we are losing by not playing. And then let's compare whether we lose more by playing or we lose less by playing. And then you make a decision. I don't believe in people doing things in, in emotion or copying other countries. Maybe the South African clubs, if even they cancel a league, the sponsorship money might still be there. And so they would rather uh, stay at home and pay the players. What if you don't have to sponsor one? The contract with the player is still running. And unless you are saying we are terminating, they're mutually agreeing to terminate the contract. Mm -hmm. Whether you want to resume, the players want to play football. Whether in an empty stadium or because they become rusty. And that's their livelihood. If you stop playing football for a very long time, you become rusty. He's lost his source of livelihood forever. So let's not only think about just the club officials. Now, boxing, like many other sports, has been largely impacted by the lack of mainstream professional activity due to the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. But recovery is in the making for many boxers eager to get back into the ring. Here is a report by Daniel Yeboa highlighting what some boxers have been up to in the spirit. So we are here at the bronze boxing gym where boxers continue their daily routine and with the effort to become world champion in the world. Despite coronavirus affecting all sports, but they are ensuring social distancing, they are opening up to the number of boxers here. You realize that quite a few boxers behind me, it tells you that boxing is in a halt, but these boxers are continuing to pursue their dreams. Many of these young talents box and weave around a punch bag, hoping on and off concrete as they practice for what could one day secure them fame and glory. Such is the mentality of former IBF lightweight title champion Richard Comey who started his career from the bronze boxing gym in Accra. And this coronavirus has changed everything and it has changed uh, the bronze gym if I have to be specific and it's difficult. I myself have not been finding it easy so if you don't take care you just throw someone away I still have to motivate them, I still have to tell them that that is not a fault of anyone. So they just have to manage, control and just be, be strong and I mean, I mean be brave and just take it one after the other and I believe these hard days will pass by. The punch bags here have daily company, enough proof of the pugilistic regime needed to stay grounded. For most, 
it is hit hard and we all go home. Daniel Selassie is certainly afraid of catching the virus, but says it should not be a hindrance to his training routine. I'm seriously afraid, but it's not, it's not because of the corona I cannot train. I always train my personal training instead of coming to the gym. Other boxers like Felix Nuhu and Emmanuel Korte are optimistic of becoming world champions with Ghana producing seven already. Well, singing in only local languages won't sell your music globally. That's according to music producer Bao Jay in his advice to Ghanaian artists. He spoke to Onia FM's If You Any Fear with Dr. Prekese. Renowned sound engineer Albert Aya Hansen, popularly known as Bao Jay, expressed worry about the trend. He revealed that if Ghanaian artists insist on singing in the local language despite using American instrumentation, it will be difficult to sell their music on the international market. We have culture music and we have commercial music. Maybe we will not be able to promote music, but if one really sell to the music out there and to the world out there, you have to um, fix it with what is commercial out there, and that's called trends. So that's what we do to pick Ghanaian music, our own music, and put it together, and we can sell it out there. If you don't add English to it, and it's just three, then you have to make sure that your instrument are sounding very typical native African. I mean, I sound engineer. But if you're going to use the American instrument and speak Tria, Udu on Mombeka say, ah, but you sound just like us. It's no different. According to him, African arts such as Fela Kuti, Anjali Kijo, and Natongo, among others who mostly sang in local languages, appealed to the international market because their instrumentation had an African feel. Money, sad effect, you ain't chillin', mine is clean, but... I mean, you have the likes of Aisha, uh, Weala, uh, you know, Osibisa, mm -hmm. um, Jedu Bleambole, all those people. They also went Making international names internationally, yes. With Absolutely. indigenous songs. Mm. So, yeah, I think that the point on the beat is also another thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It plays a role. True. They, they, they work side by side. Yeah. But that's all from us this evening on News 360. Thanks for joining us this evening as well. Make a date tomorrow evening as well. And don't forget to wash your hands as frequently as possible. Use alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Wear your face mask if you have to go out and stay at home if you have no business going out. My name is Aisha Yaku. My name is Alfred Okansi. Good evening.